You're listening to Nightmare on Film Street. The current time is 666. Traffic is clear ahead from here to the afterlife. But it's hell outside. For the next hour, you're on Nightmare Time. So, let's give a grave welcome to our hosts, John and Kim. Hello again, fiends, and welcome back to Nightmare on Film Street, the horror movie podcast for the casually obsessed. Obsessed! I'm John. I'm Kim. And this week we're discussing Watts Craven. We're we're talking about two Wes Craven. Two techno terrors from Wes Craven. Yeah, two (laughs) (laughs) electricity-based horror movies from Wes Craven. This week we're talking about Shocker from 1989, Uh, a, a true... I'm I'm ready to hear Sad some story. I, I'm here to I'm here to see some adjectives coming out of your mouth because <laughs> it was so hard not to talk while we watched this movie. Yeah, it was the most excruciating movie watching experience of my life. Yeah, if we were Mystery Science Theater, then this is, would have been episode number one. This sure. would have been it. <laughs> yeah, no, this movie is heartbreaking. We were robbed. Of another incredible horror franchise from what are you talking about? From Wes Craven himself. Oh my god! You know, <laughs> not not unlike my, the My Bloody Valentine, which if they had a, had the uncut version in theaters, we'd have ten more of those movies. This you was... can't bring My Bloody Valentine into this. That is a fucking pedestal. That is so high up. Shocker is like some digital fuzz down here. Shocker is the problem with filmmaking. Now, filmmaking (laughs) is... Now, Kim would agree with me, but for completely different reasons. The problem with filmmaking is that it is a collaborative medium. You know? Like, it's it's an art form that employs hundreds of people. (laughs) You're saying you needed somebody to tell Wes no sometimes. No, I'm saying we needed 100 Wes Cravens on site. So that way... It could have all gotten done. More Wesses. <laughs> yeah. There, it, this movie it got an X rating 13 times before it got an R rating to go into the movie theater. Their fucking digital effects guy shit the bed. Like, just completely failed. They had to rescue this movie. Like, they had to rescue the negatives of this movie all across Hollywood to finish it in, like, a month before it came out in the movie theater kind of situation. Wow. And... It was built and it, it designed, developed to be a franchise. This was supposed to be like Friday the 13th, like Final Destination like a or Nightmare A Nightmare on, on Elm Street, Street. <laughs> which is not a huge surprise when you watch the movie. Like very clearly made by the same guy. Now, Kim obviously disagrees with me. <laughs> Maybe. I don't I, know. You know, I, you've provided some evidence here. I'm willing to hear you out. But you're still wrong. <laughs> okay. Okay. Before we get into it, like that's just that's just a little tease of how I feel about this movie. Kim, I would like your help putting together three good things for people. Now, this movie's got a reputation. It's kooky, it's wacky, a lot of people. The fact that it's directed by Wes Craven and it's not a household name kind of movie maybe says something about the quality of it to some people. But there's at least three good things there, about it. There's some gold in this movie. This movie shines bright. Intermittently. <laughs> Intermittently. Okay. Uh, so okay. my first good thing is massage chair of doom. I think that's one of the best. Masa- <laughs> I think that's one of the best moments of the film. We'll talk about it in a bit, I'm sure. Yeah. But a massage chair that seems very not integral to the plot, but is frequently used, becomes a method of mayhem. <laughs> okay. Uh, good thing number two. We have a villain. <laughs> We have a serial killer who's been unstoppable and has he's murdered everything, count- countless <laughs> families, and th- so they're gonna. He's oh, we're streamlining him right to the electric chair, and he's so evil that fast even- tracked, fast tracked. It's like the same day they bring him to the to the the electric chair. He's so evil that when they zap him, he doesn't die. He just becomes electricity. That's what I was gonna say. Is that he's a serial killer? He's a satanist with magical powers, and then he also just becomes electricity instead of a ghost? It's the best. Like, when when we talk about performers being electric, this is what they mean. <laughs> Good thing number three, heavy metal soundtrack. 
Don't you love a goofy off the wall killer movie? I could have no, done y- with a little more heavy metal. You know what? I changed my mind. That's that's <laughs> not even it. Good thing number three is a seven year old girl who says fuck a bunch and tries to kill people with a tractor. Can't go wrong. Yeah, I was so surprised when we first saw her. I did not think she was going to be evil. And I was like, it would be so good if she went evil. And then she did. And, and I was like, did. Wes, you read my mind. Wes, you're the best. <laughs> You've done it again. <laughs> but not really. So those are just three good things. We're going to be, shut up. <laughs> shut up right now. That's not the kind of energy we're bringing into this podcast. <laughs> it kind of sounds like regardless of whether you think this movie's trash or whether you're hoping somebody out there considers it a trash piece, this is the episode for you. It's somewhere in between trash and trash piece. It's not quite trash, but it's not quite a trash piece. And we're going to get to the <laughs> bottom of it in a minute. We'll be right back. <laughs> We are here today to bear witness to the execution of Horace Pinker, whose unspeakable atrocities have horrified the people of this great state. He stands convicted of 52 counts of aggravated assault, 23 counts of armed robbery, and 37 counts of murder in the first degree. Prisoner, have any final words? Yeah. No more Mr. Nice Guy. I don't think he's dead. Contact. He's among you. Now, Wes Craven brings you his greatest creation. No more! Shocker. Wes Craven's unheralded masterpiece, (laughs) Shocker, is currently sitting at a 5.5 out of 10 on IMDb, 30% on Rotten Tomatoes, and a 2.8 out of 5 on Letterboxd. That's high. (laughs) Yeah. Now, it might also just be that we have decades of filmmaking from Wes Craven to to pull from and look back on, because you can't help but watch this movie as a retrospective. Because it's got everything that Wes Craven's obsessed about, right? Yeah, and, and you find that the more like the more we've been going through Wes Craven's deep cuts, you can really see the blueprints of the things he was interested in. Yeah. I found that especially when we watched, what was that, like, pilgrimy one? We did it on the podcast. I keep wanting to say Incubus. Deadly, deadly Blessing. Deadly yeah. Blessing? Yeah. Yeah. That one I was, like, so cool to watch in retrospect because you can see all of those, like, those muscles that he's flexing for the first time that he really honed in and and made some of the most iconic horror movies of all time. Yeah. This one is kind of a weird collage of the good and the bad. <laughs> the good and the bad. Okay, now it, it, agreed, sure, there are some choices. It's an artistic the choices, statement. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> but yeah, even not not even just the fact that we've got a serial killer who sort of like stretches beyond death to continue his 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 rampage. Kind of like a certain dream demon. Kind of like a dream <laughs> demon. Yeah, and who also we have a dream element in this movie. We do. We've the the opening of the movie is the is the killer Fixing a television in the same way that Freddy is building his glove in the opening of Nightmare on Elm Street. But it even has, like, the ghost of a loved one that really sh- maybe shouldn't be there. Kind of like in Scream 3, where Sydney's mom just sort of shows up. Oh, yeah. In and this- she's all spooky. Yeah, in this one, we've got the ghost of a girlfriend who, uh, <laughs> this is <laughs> this is maybe the only thing that I think is goofy. Where She's like, no, I can't go to the light. I have to help my boyfriend, maybe. <laughs> maybe. A-, a love beam shoots out of her to stop Horace. Horace Pinker, oh the boy! Villain. Oh boy! Okay, so the, the the villain in this movie is called Horace Pinker, which I think is actually not a bad name. It's a good name. I think it's a great name, and it's, yeah. especially like he's a TV repairman, like Horace Pinker. I could see Horace on a jumpsuit. I could also see uh, Pinker on the side of a van. I'll tell you right now. I could see that on our on our merch store very soon, Kim. I think maybe you should get into like a TV repair, like Pinker's sh- TV repair. I should repair. start buying mechanic jumpsuits and fixing them up. If you could, that'd be great. I mean, there's so many horror villains that that would work for. <laughs> the, uh, the man, the other thing, talking about jumpsuits, there's tons of jumpsuits in this movie. He starts with a TV ma- uh, TV repairman jumpsuit. He ends up in a death row jumpsuit, which is just a cool look. 
for a villain. He's got that orange jumpsuit with the black and white checkered stripes across the center of it. Does he wear that the rest of the movie? He wears like that when the he's the ghost? Of the movie. I mean, is he a ghost? This is confusing. <laughs> that's the yeah, that's that's up for debate. Because he does deflate after being electrocuted. <laughs> yeah, okay. So he's a TV <laughs> repairman. And And here in rot lies the problem. Listen to John try to explain the plot of this. <laughs> I'm gonna go step by step. I'm gonna make this real easy for you, Kim. Don't worry. <laughs> All right, because Wikipedia did not help. My favorite part, though, is that the opening credits of the movie where we're trying to, like, learn a little bit about Horace Pinker, he's not building a weapon. He's just fixing a television. He's like, oh, I gotta get these fucking tubes in here and I gotta get these wires connected. But I the love TV that he's comes been, on. I love that he's been a lifelong serial killer from what we learn later on, but he still holds a daytime job. He's still a, an entrepreneur. <laughs> He, yeah, I guess you you don't think maybe he killed. Well, I guess it is the Pinker name. I just I, you know there, there there definitely exists a world maybe where he killed a guy and took over his business. But yeah, he's filing taxes. I assume he's clearly getting calls. Yeah, and I think it's like we've tuned in right at the point Ooh, like where that. he's. Thank you. <laughs> he's become unhinged. Like he's he's crossed. This is you really he's think this crossed is it? business and pleasure because he's killing <laughs> Jonathan's family with the van out front. Serial killer mistake. I don't think he's ever given a fuck. I think he's no. Always, I think he's just he's this unhinged. Is, this, this is him. He is cracked. He's gone too far. This is him in berserker mode. Okay, you think that he's really taken painstaking efforts until now to hide his tracks? Uh, <laughs> I don't think there were any painstaking efforts for anything, uh, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so he's not building the weapon at the beginning, he's fixing the TV, the TV comes on in enough time for us to learn that he is the kind of serial killer who just shows up and murders an entire fucking family. Writes, like, messages on the wall and their blood. He's a real nuisance. <laughs> a nuisance. <laughs> in the community, yeah. They're like, we gotta do something about this serial murderer. Uh, he's killed countless families at this point. Including Heather Langenkamp. Including Heather Langenkamp in, like, a quick little cameo, because Wes is the best. And for some reason, there's a football quarterback... <laughs> Who's distracted by girls. Well, he's a high school quarterback. He's so clumsy in the beginning of the movie that it is a stretch to believe he's going to be our hero, the our kung fu hero the rest of the movie. Don't say it like that. Look, he's the hero. He's not the he's hero the we deserve. He's the karate dream kid. <laughs> he's got... He, he's, been, he's having dreams about Horace Pinker. He's literally... Man, he's not just seeing... The murders happen. He's actually there. That was really confusing to me because I wasn't sure for the first two dreams if Horace could actually like see him. I know he was interacting with him in the dreams, mm -hmm. but I thought maybe they were like like shows because this is a TV thing. Like I thought they were. <laughs> He's the live replays. audience. Wow, you're making this better for me. <laughs> yeah, so they were replays so that like he was watching Horace commit these murders, but Horace couldn't see you know what i mean oh like, like horace he's... wasn't aware that jonathan was on to him yeah. horace couldn't see the tv audience no but he's literally interacting with this kid in the moment and he's also not surprised to see him no he's like oh hey man nice to see you you want to see something fucked up you want to see something fun like it's he is playing to a live audience in that moment i love that uh but it's very strange it is so strange super strange. and also so they he's... like dive into each other a lot and then we're hey, like wake hey, up hey, that's... <laughs> That's just good filmmaking, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so he's, yeah, he's astral projecting into these mm, crime scenes, and he's seeing them happen, and he's explaining it to his girlfriend and his father, who's a cop. P.S. He's adopted. Uh, he's a foster kid. All of his siblings, before they were murdered by Horace Pinker, were also foster children. Uh, it seems like the, the the detective and his wife couldn't have kids, so they just fostered a bunch. And Which, honestly, great character. A detective who just, like, like, takes in kids from, like, bad situations. Love that guy. That's great. That's how when you hear, you know, like, a fire department rescues, like, a dog that has no sure. parents, yep. <laughs> and then it just becomes the firehouse dog, and you're like, this was his destiny. Is that how it happens? I think so. That's how we like Unless it's a it Dalmatian, happens. I think they get those. They, you can't just... Those are appointed by the city. <laughs> Like the annual Christmas tree lighting. They're like, the annual, I mean, the the Dalmatian of the city. The lighting of the Dalmatian, <laughs> yeah. So, and they, everybody gathers for the coloring of the Dalmatian. <laughs> I like His that. own little fire hydrant, they cut a ribbon. <laughs> what Kim's trying to say is that at some point, this teenager <laughs> has his entire family uh, murdered. Well, his mother and his siblings. 
and he sees it in graphic detail. Like, so much so that it's unnerving to his dad when he describes how the fingers are broken. Like, he he sees the whole murder okay, take place. Okay, you are, so this is not plot imperative, but you are not describing the fact that he met his dad at a, like, a seedy downtown bar to have this conversation. And this It was is, after the funeral! But this is, like, before we're completely solidified on the characters and the circumstance, and we're just... In a scene with a kid that we know is in high school, just mm-hmm. like hanging out with his bar dad, and then his, his dad's like, "Shut up!" and drops some money on the counter and walks out. Like this is his ex partner who was fired for drinking on the job, and he's like, "You can't talk to me about these cases anymore." They have a special relationship. Like the, he calls him Donnie instead of Dad. I just thought the the captions were wrong <laughs> for a lot of the film. But here, here's what you're complaining about. Efficient filmmaking. <laughs> You're saying efficient <laughs> filmmaking? Okay, I'm being. I'm, I'm not. I'm being a little silly here. I, I'm not even going to respond to that. It's unclear whether or not Horace knows exactly who this kid is. Like, clearly, he stumbled in on a crime that Horace was committing, and then I guess he recognized the identity immediately, and then found his family and killed and killed them intentionally. He didn't just happen upon them. It wasn't oh, yeah, an accident. That, that is a leap. Okay, keep going. And this kid, whose name I can't remember, is it Mark? <laughs> Jonathan? It's Jonathan. It's your own how, name. <laughs> how could I not remember? So Jonathan keeps having these dreams. Uh, he's, man, you know. And then what happens, John? <laughs> how do they catch him? <laughs> he enrolls the help of his high school football buddy. Uh, uh, real Nightmare on Elm Street style. Like, and hey, man, Ted Raimi. You got to And Ted Raimi. Who's, for his, some scenes. <laughs> nickname is Pac-Man in this movie. He's like the towel boy for the football team. Um, he, it's a real sort of Simpsons style Nightmare on Elm Street moment where it's like, hey, man, you got to watch me while I sleep. You got to make sure I'm OK. And then, you know, if I start screaming, you wake me up so I don't accidentally get murdered while I'm astral projecting. Stupid Glenn. We find out the location of the murder and then we zip over there and stop him instead of getting his dad the instead police of officer the who he's got a direct line to yeah he's got one degree of separation away from the head of the police but the thing is his dad kind of believes him now because of how like creepy his his ability to recount the crime scene was so the the cops are secretly tailing him anyway they think that he's the murderer and they show up but then there's this like long extended moment where everybody's just standing in the street even though we all know there's a murder happening in the apartment above and then they all run up and you're just like okay do you believe him or do you not believe him and then it's just like to him to jonathan do you believe your dreams or do you do not do you not like get the fuck up there okay so i take back everything i said about efficient filmmaking because this is where the movie actually starts <laughs> like we're a half an hour into our discussion the movie has just begun i this thought is it where started we... when horace pinker got executed this is where we arrest horace pinker and then zip bam boom we're at the execution day. Yeah, he it's bought Friday. He bought that Disney genie pass for uh, <laughs> Magic Kingdom to like you know no appeals straight to the the electric chair. There's there's no discussion about it. We're not. He didn't even have to shave his head in between being arrested and getting the electric chair. This guy's been looking forward to this day. He uh... oh he's stoked. He loves electricity. <laughs> <laughs> he loves electricity. It's his favorite thing. Now this is this is the only real roadblock. Of the movie. The Satanism? Every, see, exactly. Is it satanic? Who knows? There were candles and runes or whatever on the floor. But what, okay, this is my favorite thing about the Satanism, though. The Satanism is also tied to electricity. I like The to... TV in his room is part <laughs> of the spell, John. <laughs> it's TV magic. I like to pretend it's black magic or voodoo more than Satanism, just because it sounds cooler to say. With a TV. With a T. V, baby. Isn't it great? Somehow, Horace Pinker has great. gotten his Question hands <laughs> on jumper cables. And They're jumper cables? Yeah. Now, it's prison. You can get anything in prison. He had, the fact that he had candles was the biggest leap of all. You could, like, you're like, jumper cables, sure, but candles? How? <laughs> he doesn't have anybody to smuggle this in for him. Uh, and he's enough of a badass that I highly doubt anybody's doing him favors. But when they come to get him to to take him to the electric chair, 
He's stripped the TV apart. He's got jumper cables attached to it. There's candles and runes and stuff drawn on the floor. Uh, and he's electrocuting himself, but he's talking to the TV like it's a god. Also similar to uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, where the TV's up top doing funky stuff. <laughs> doing funky things. <laughs> it's prime time, bitch. And this guy is about to conquer death. I don't know how. <laughs> If only maybe in that opening scene we saw him, we just, honestly, we just needed a scene of him looking through an old book of black magic and doing weird spells with the television. You know, we needed some sort of foundation for this guy's trying to do black magic with electricity and TVs. Or even just a scene, like we're in his lair at one point and he's got so many TVs stacked up and it's just like a really cool setting. Yeah. If we just had him walk by and all the TVs turned on following him. Something. Like he's got some kind of metaphysical connection to the TVs. Yeah. Like Instead he's of just contr- being like, yeah. I'm a TV repairman, black magic. Figure it out. <laughs> right, right. So that's maybe my only complaint is that I just and I, I, I have to think it ha- it's somewhere. I'm gonna on... hold you to this being your only complaint. <laughs> well, okay, fine. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see how it goes. I, I just have to believe that somewhere on the cutting room floor, uh, somewhere in how it was edited and put together, and like how much of a nightmare post production seemed to be, that the, there were answers for those questions. That there were a little more, I, I guess, rules on how Horace Pinker works and his his powers that we're just not seeing here. So you're you're giving the film credit for the things you didn't see on the screen. <laughs> I think we should always give credit <laughs> for vision. <laughs> like, there, there is a vision <laughs> that Wes really tried to seek out, and it's just, you know, sometimes it doesn't always work. Now, cl- clearly, people were not as receptive to this movie as I'd hoped, you know, and that's the movie's fault at the end of the day. It was not a huge success. A lot of people went the fuck you know (laughs) walking out of this theater they weren't like you gotta see this they were like you really shouldn't see this it doesn't seem like there was a word of mouth campaign afterward which bums me out um i grew up obsessed with the trailer of this movie i would see it ahead of tons of movies that i owned on vhs and i was just like one day when i'm big i'm gonna watch that shocker it's gonna be the greatest movie i've ever seen and it was almost that The, the trailer was kind of fantastic oh my god right no more Mr. Nice Guy. They flip the switch, he gets fried, and then he turns into fucking, like, evil electricity? That's the thing about this movie. Okay. It is four excruciating hours of cinema. <laughs> but there are so many good <laughs> moments that if you cut them, if you if you accordion the whole thing and you just do the scenes, and, and it still makes no sense, uh-huh. but it's just bam, bam, bam. Yeah. Like, there's so much good shit in this. It's just excruciating getting to each one because there are so many piss poor decisions and lacks of decisions people running to places and then just standing there for 10 minutes and then something cool what kim is describing is a movie that gives you time to go back to the concession stand get another beer and not miss anything i think this is a perfect movie you don't have to hit pause on it just make sure you're back in time for horace pinker to start body jumping from person to person and doing all kinds of fucking shit shenanigans there are again there are no big rules that explain how this shit works but after he's electric uh, after he's electrocuted uh he escapes his own body <laughs> you know <laughs> his body deflates like it's just a pile of skin no bones and he just hops into people uh w- wherever it's convenient doesn't seem like it's an issue if he kills that person while he's inside that body he just like rises up out of it Goes into an goes into the fucking plug outlet in the wall. Comes out in somebody else's body. There's a fight on top of a television tower, and, and you know, oh, we got him cornered now. Where's he gonna go? Apparently, nationwide. <laughs> <laughs> he hits one of the t- TV antennas, and now he's in every home in America. Yep. I love some of the decisions in this movie. I, I don't necessarily understand what it's trying to say about TV, you know? Because <laughs> uh, even in the beginning, we're watching, uh, like, when, when Jonathan meets up with his girlfriend, uh, she is working at a sort of, like, hot dog stand on campus. What? 
I don't even remember this. He's like, give me my soda. And he's like, why are you always watching the oh, sh- yeah. that news junk? Because she's complaining that the news is just like full of murder and mayhem and it's gross and disgusting. He's like, if you don't like it, you just got to change the channel. Isn't this after his family was brutally murdered or is this before? I don't think he knows that his family. Oh, you mean like his his new family. No, this is before. This is <laughs> not literally, his second family, the not opening. the first family. I mean, I mean, we're also glossing over the fact that at his execution, Horace Pinker reveals that he is the biological father of Jonathan. They give him a lot of time. Time to talk <laughs> and that his one tell how you can how you know Horace Pinker is in somebody's body is that he's got a, a, a limp leg uh, because as a child his limps occur in the brain <laughs> <laughs> yes as a child <laughs> Jonathan uh, tried to stop Horace from abusing his mother shot him in the leg gave him a permanent limp um, and that was that was how uh, the police got called, and he got taken away into custody, into cust- into children's services, child services, and got fostered by this detective. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's how we explain the psychic <laughs> connection between Horace Pinker and Jonathan. <laughs> like I don't uh, you, you, some, uh, the some... all of a sudden psychic connection. <laughs> you know, one murder before the murder of his family. <laughs> The voodoo's in the genes, baby. You know, like it's somehow because Horace Pinker has tapped into something ethereal uh, that it also passes down to his son as well. Like there's some sort of uh, okay. So this ability them. is new. Maybe the Satanism is new. The TV black magic is a when, new addition to Horace Pinker's toolkit or to the world. Are you trying to say that this is a new thing? Like we're we're, we're well, I feel like Horace Pinker is a little bit is you know. The only, the first and only person to harness the TV powers. But yeah, like maybe he's just gotten into it. Like he's just passed. Oh yeah, no, I think it's relatively new. And that's maybe what's unlocked the shit with his son. Like, oh, TV power now exists? Well, you're, it's in your blood now. And your your blood is Jonathan? What? Question mark? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, so after... <laughs> I don't have answers for that. After after the execution and like the whole uh the whole the chaos that ensues with him being like fucking fried and not going well and falling out of the chair and disappearing basically. Um he jumps into one of the um one of the attendants, I think I think the physician that's looking over the execution, she kills some cops by crashing the car. He jumps into one of the cops. He chases Jonathan in the park because Jonathan knows something's up. Oh, the extended park sequence. That, that was one hour in and of itself. Surprisingly long sequence. Why do we just stay at the park? But worth it. Like, <laughs> that's where we get the seven-year-old girl. Like He jumps from the police officer into... Uh, who, he jumps into the police officer into the girl, right? He doesn't jump into the, the runner. Like, he just shoots the runner with no, his No, he jumps into the runner, but he's only in the runner briefly, and then he's in the girl. Then there's this crazy scene where it's Jonathan, the possessed little girl, and then the mom of the little girl. Chasing after them. Chasing each other like a <laughs> rom-com. <laughs> it's literally like the sequence in Monkey Bone when dead Corky Romano is just, like, running through the city <laughs> and everyone is chasing him. It is just bullshit. <laughs> oh, I love it. We're not even using his real name. We're just calling him Corky Romano. <laughs> I don't know what his real name is. <laughs> Chris Catan. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's good stuff. I love it. Uh, I <laughs> and, you know, he uh, obviously he gets away. He At uh, some point, his girlfriend is murdered, too. Maybe we, we should. We glossed <laughs> over that. Yeah. So before before Horace is caught. You're doing a great job synopsizing this film. <laughs> it weaves a web. <laughs> Before, he, before I, you know, I could not flashback. I could not do. I could not do a better job sitting here trying to describe what a racer head is about. We watched what, this movie like six hours ago. <laughs> I'm just saying, some movies resonate on an emotional level, and you just they just feel right. Trying to explain it makes it hard. You know, it's mm. not they, they 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 don't they don't work in a narrative a standard narrative structure. It's just a movie you got to vibe with. Okay, it's vibrating on a specific frequency. Some might all right, say. just get just get back to it. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so Horace kills this guy's girlfriend. It's real brutal. He writes on the walls, um, and at some point, uh, surprising, she becomes surprising, very surprising. I, I was like, "Whoa, we're killing the girlfriend." She had main character energy, and then I realized she was going to be a ghost throughout. The she movie. was going to be a ghost throughout the rest of this. with a magical necklace with some abilities unexplained. I don't quite understand the necklace also and the necklace we now we learn the necklace is very important uh and it has some sort of key to 
fighting Horus. Like he becomes very weak. Y- you know, it's a it's a he can't talisman. look at it. Yeah, he yeah. can't look at it like a vampire at a cross. I guess it's like a mother's love, like but how it, that can always banish a demon no matter what. But it also helps him like go into the TV world. Like it's got a lot of magical ambiguous ability I, th- I yeah i think maybe it's it's a love and hate relationship and both emotions are equally as strong but it's about how you use them and what you use them for Ho- horace obviously his magic i think comes from the death and destruction you know like he's tapping into a dark energy uh and jonathan is tapping into white magic a love energy that is you know it's it's like monsters inc baby you know screams they're powerful but laughs Ten times better. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was awful. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'm eye rolling into oblivion. <laughs> yeah. And, and so he Horus at Horus in the park grabs the necklace, throws it in the water, and Jonathan- oh my god! <laughs> and then we get an extended <laughs> sequence where we need diving goggles in order to get the necklace out of the lake because it's the only thing that will defeat Horus. But I can't go back and get the goggles. You must go it's- get the goggles. Well, I wait here until dark. The last. Time he was there, he saw his dead girlfriend. He just doesn't want to go back there anymore. It's too he goes back much. there a lot. He goes back there after he has to. He's got to confront those fears. Stop trying to justify the goggle <laughs> sequence, the extended goggle chapter. When if he... we watched this on DVD <laughs> and had to go back, it'd be like, uh, must get the goggles. Didn't get the goggles. Oh, the goggles are broken. Yes. Three chapters, <laughs> and then he gets the necklace without the goggles. The goggles weren't important, Kim. He had to... He He had the goggles inside him all (laughs) All along. All along, yeah. (laughs) It was the love that he had for For the goggles along the way. (laughs) That's the compass he had to use to find the necklace. (sighs) Now, I don't like that sequence either. He goes back to the water. He's like, God damn it. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to find him for reasons. (laughs) He he dives into the water several times, and it isn't until like his his ghost girlfriend shows up in a super creepy way. Favorite 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 moment of the movie. Yeah, she pops up out of the water. And they she's propel like, her like she's on a fucking skidoo. Yeah, it's like Jennifer's body where she, where Jennifer's just like slow like uh, floating across the pool. Like it looks creepy as fuck. It is on the same level as the creepy old lady ghost in Thirteen Ghosts. Like when she rolls through with the candle. Or is that House on Haunted Hill? Whatever. It's the best scare ever. And this, almost on par with that. It's amazing. So good. Another great Wes Craven moment in water. Like, that's just like, we, we had a snake in the tub in Deadly Blessing. We had a we had an endless tub that, that Nancy gets yanked into in Nightmare on Elm Street. And we got this pretty good <laughs> Propelly sequence. Propelly ghost girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Propelly ghost girlfriend. <laughs> it's a great image. It's not a great scene, unfortunately. It's so good. When we saw the trailer, it's what made me want to actually watch this movie. <laughs> not the electricity guy? Not, not the Horace el- No, I was like, whatever. Not fucking, uh, I don't know his name. Not Skinner from the X-Files being a fucking sadistic serial killer, man. I don't know it was Skinner. So his face is embedded as like a real calm, collected voice of reason from that show. And to see him absolutely unhinged in this is so much fun. Now, obviously, this came out before the X Files. It's like when you saw Titanic before Demon Knight, and you were like, "Holy shit!" Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it took me a half a second to realize what you were getting at, but yes, absolutely. You know, I probably saw Demon Knight before Titanic. <laughs> I saw Demon Knight the moment it came on VHS. I rented that fucker every week. Well, some of us didn't have a TV movie child. Some of us didn't have that cool video store hookup. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now this is where some of the this is where this is this is this is where the movie gets wet and wild. Like, this is this is where it gets weird. This is where we've got a lot of decisions, most of them great. Some of them probably compromises. Okay, uh, we, we, we've got a we've got two camps. We've got Jonathan set up back at the house. He's got a local TV station uh, news anchor there who's going to help him trap. Horace Pinker uh, across And we're town. given no information how and or no, why. No, he's just like, you just gotta fucking trust me, bro. At the specific moment, even though I'm gonna do a lot of non-efficient things between now and then, and it's kind of a crapshoot whether I'll make it here on time. Don't you don't you love imagining the that whole scenario from the news anchor's perspective, though? Uh, like, okay, so I've got my cameras here. 
this kid's promising me that he's going to get me the serial killer responsible for all these deaths, even though everybody in the town thinks Jonathan is the serial killer at this point. They think it's a copycat and that it's Jonathan. And that it's Jonathan. (laughs) Now, he's promising that he's going to get them the man responsible for these slayings. And he doesn't tell them how. And they're really, they really don't want to commit to this, but also this would get them like a Pulitzer Prize. Like this is going to, this is going to change your entire career. And then he's like, all right, I'm going to go get him for you. And then he goes to bed. Like that's, (laughs) that's, if you're the news crew, that's what you're seeing. Like, don't worry guys. I'm going to get this fucking guy for you. I'm just going to have a quick little snooze. Yeah. And he goes on a full date with his girlfriend. (laughs) One last time, right? It's because they made a specific point to reference that they were both virgins at the beginning of the movie. So I think what we had was them they? finally consummating their relationship in the as, afterlife as slash dream world. Where he's an astral projected ghost and she's an afterlife ghost? Yes. So. Well, all of the dead family and friends watch on from down the field. It's hot. <laughs> across town also we've got like the rest of the football crew um that are breaking into the power grid for the entire town mm-hmm. and we don't necessarily know it at this point but the the expectation the, the plan is that jonathan is going to t- trap horace in the tv world <laughs> and then cut the power to the city which would effectively he thinks kill him there's no proof that that's true it seems that every turn, this guy's completely unstoppable. He can just disappear into the electric grid. I guess I just don't know how electric grids work, you know? Like, maybe... I, I, I would expect that he could just disperse and go somewhere else Couldn't completely. he just go into a battery? Now you're talking se- <laughs> sequel territory, baby. This is how we bring it back. He's in a Tesla now. <laughs> Where he goes in a solar panel, and then you're like, we're fucked now. Yeah, that's the, that's the man, that's how we could have revitalized this franchise. Five or six sequels in, we go solar power, just like, oh shit, Horace is, oh, Pinker's gone green. <laughs> okay, so this is where we get some of the best imagery of the movie, but also some of the goofiest shit imaginable. Uh, Jonathan has gone into his dream so he can fight Horace Pinker in person. They've gone into television by is jumping through it. Is he sleeping while that's happening? I he's, can't. he's sleeping while all this is happening, but also maybe possibly not there. I don't quite know how it works. It's like he has, he has 100% gone to sleep, but then at some point at the end of the movie, like it's his physical body that's jumping out of the camera. <laughs> now, so we're in the TV world. The image of him climbing in and out of TVs and diving into TVs is truly wonderful. It's fantastic. They they do a great job of all of the weird TV rendering of Horace Pinker and Jonathan as well, going in and out of the TVs. But it's especially because of Horace Pinker because he's semi-translucent. So you know there's kind of like, there's got to be double shots of everything, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. And, and able to do that. And they've got these really cool, like, rendered TV sets where... Actors are physically jumping in and out of them. Yeah, the rules the rules of it are just fun. Like that's what you get it's just The fun. rules are non-existent. No, because they're <laughs> they're going into sequences like they're going into like stock footage of uh of bombs being dropped in Vietnam. We're jumping into like, you know, I love Lucy. I love Lucy and and uh, an actual news broadcast that's where that's being like l- recorded live talking about them being able to be seen on TV, so fucking meta. And then they they drop onto the table and they're fighting on top of the table and the news anchor's like, holy shit, they're here with us now! And then they disappear into another spot, which I don't quite fully understand. So they go to the sets or they go, are <laughs> they in right, the... I, exactly. I just, are, they, are they physically <laughs> traveling to the sets? I don't know. <laughs> like, is this time travel? What is happening? Because they go, they interact with Frankenstein. <laughs> it's great. Don't it you is, love that shit? It is great. Yeah. It's fantastic. It's worth the goofiness of the rest of it. Now, they wind up back in his house, and right when Pinker is about to stab Jonathan, Jonathan grabs the remote and hits pause. And it stops Horace Pinker, and he's like, he can't move. And then all of a sudden, it's a fucking Wii remote. <laughs> and then it's a Wii remote. Now, that's a choice, where he... <sighs> He can pick him up and he can sl- throw him across the TV because it's like the infrared beams like got a hold of him. I don't necessarily love that. Even saying the infrared beam has got a hold of him is, is too much <laughs> description for what's happening here. 
<laughs> well, it's, it's, it is what's happening, man. It would have been way better if, now, this maybe would have been the cheesy ending where he just hits rewind and then, like, his girlfriend comes back because Horace Pinker gets rewound and, like, everything that he did doesn't happen anymore. That seems- like click? Like, click, or, like, Nancy saying, like, I take back all the power I gave you, yada yada. We could have, I guess Wes was just like, oh, shit, I think I'm writing the same movie. Maybe I <laughs> maybe I shouldn't do that. Uh, but he basically locks him in the television world, and then before Pinker has a chance to attack him, he puts the necklace on top of the camera lens from the camera crew, and, and Jonathan dives through through the camera to get out of the TV into the real world before the power goes out. Now, I don't mind that that's the portal to get back to the real world because it's the camera is what's creating the TV world. Like that kind of makes sense. Don't give me that look. I see it. people can hear that look you're giving me right now. <laughs> I was just closing my eyes and trying to follow the thread. <laughs> Kim's trying to not be here right now. <laughs> She's like, "How do I astral project out of here into the bath?" Oh, that'd be nice. Ooh, little duck. <laughs> it's so calm in here. Uh, yeah, and that's that's essentially the end of the movie. We, we he jumps out so just in time. We kill the power grid. And Horace is gone forever. When does the evil chair come? When is the girlfriend like? I have to tell you something. I have to tell you something. She never does. And no, she when does she use something. the beam of love? So that, when are all these? Are these in the TV? Are no, they so in the, the real those, world? So I'm, I'm, that's my that's my fault. I did jump over that. That's in <laughs> season three of the movie where we go back to his apartment when the, the, the coach never shows up. Oh, yeah, because the Ramey. coach gets possessed and kills himself. Yes, the coach gets possessed. He kills Ted Raimi off screen. In the closet. In the closet. With the goggles. With, he, he busts the goggles. Uh, that's also where um, the coach kills himself. There's a bit of a back and forth. Like I love when he talks to his dad in the other room, doesn't say anything about the corpses in his bedroom. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, gotta get Horace Pinker, dad. And he's like, I have to arrest you, son. <laughs> yeah, there are <laughs> bodies here right now. <laughs> yeah, he starts to think that his son is the one responsible for killing his own family, even, is what he's thinking. But okay, so but Is in, he? In that, yes, 100%. But he's Horace like, Pinker was alive at that point. Yeah, but he's like, it was really weird how you knew how your brother's fingers were broken. I think you did this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> also, maybe it's he's just starting to think that it's part of... It's it's in the blood. There's something bad with this kid. He's the son of Horace Pinker. He's just like Horace Pinker. Also, that's where we find that the dad's possessed by Horace Pinker. Let's not forget that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, before dad shows up, he sits down on a chair like, oh, man, what an exhausting day watching everybody I love get murdered Massage. in front of me. <laughs> And then the massage chair, the arms of the massage chair, come up and grab him and put him in a bear hug. And then it stands up and it slowly morphs into into Horace Pinker. I love when the massage chair has blinking eyes. It has fucking eyeballs that blink. Oh, like the buttons become eyes. Very Freddy Krueger, I will say. That is a page. That's a total Freddy. Freddy Krueger would move, totally yeah. massage chair. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, because the massage chair is electric, Horace Pinker is able to jump into it, which is the other kind of problem of this movie. Like, is he able to possess the electric world? Is he able to possess things that are electric? Maybe. Yeah, why wasn't he even evil blender? I would have loved that. Yeah. He's like, hey man, put your hand in here. It'll be great. Uh, I guess. I guess the argument there is that he's able to possess bodies because of the electrical synapses like the firing of our synapses Stop in our brains. Stop using science here. This is no place for science. He's 10 years ahead of the Matrix, man. Like, humans are just batteries. You know, like, that's how Horace Pinker's able to get in. Now, it doesn't necessarily make sense that when he leaves people, they also deflate. I don't get that. But they he's deflate? Like, he, like, uses up their, their energy. Like, they just die. So they don't all deflate, but they just, like, die of weird natural causes. So the causes. little girl died? The little girl's probably dead, yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's He's, he's killed whole families. That's no big deal. He's he's killing kids across the board in this movie. Mm. And yeah, I have a lot of questions. I don't necessarily know how it works. It could have all been smoothed out in part two and part three. You, we could... you didn't explain the power of love moment. When does that occur? It's the most powerful force on earth, Kim. I said when. <laughs> I said when. Not what. When he, it's imbued in the necklace. <laughs> like, that's his own white magic. That's the his no, own No, I was talisman. talking about the love beam. That was after the chair. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe before the chair. It's after the, it's after the coach gets killed and the coach is, is coming after him. Is she in the TV? Him. 
No, she exists on the ghost plane, Kim. <laughs> God, this is so easy to follow. How do you get lost in this? Horace Pinker comes out of the coach, and then when he's trying to attack the kid, because I guess he's going to try and jump into Jonathan, that's where she's like, not on my watch, Horace Pinker. <laughs> Blue love. Like a Care Bear. Like literally like a fucking love beam. Shoots out of her chest, like bends bear. around a corner and I kicks him out. I love when it bended. Yeah, that was fun. Because you're like, whoa, it's not light, it's ghost powers. That's also where he's like, oh, there's only one way out of here. I'm going to stick my fingers in this plug outlet. But it's not just easy enough to put my ghost fingers in the plug outlet. I got to stretch my fingers impossibly long and turn them into a fork and then go Yeah, but you know you were like, yeah. Yeah, (laughs) I know I was like, yeah, because I out loud watching that movie said, fuck yeah. (laughs) Fuck yeah, prong fingers. Fuck yeah. Ten out of (laughs) ten. This movie's great. No, see, we agree on all the same good points, like prong fingers, massage chair, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. ghost girlfriend, rowboat. Rowboat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't remember what we called her. Yeah, no, it's all And fun. the rest. <laughs> and the rest. Him, like, honestly, the, the image of him jumping, not even jumping, just like stepping out of the television is just, you know, tattooed on my brain. Like, I have watched it a thousand times in trailers, and maybe it was just, like, my child brain trying to, like, figure out what the rest of the movie was going to be. But I was like, that is pure cinema. You know, like, that's horror. That's what I want. Like, I definitely think of that moment constantly, just, like, bored at work, eating a sandwich during lunch, going, like, man, it's pretty fucking cool when he steps out of that TV. That's guaranteed a thought that I've had within the last calendar year. I haven't seen this movie. It's, like, 2019. Mm-hmm. And another thing. Diff- <laughs> it's, I guess Do you it's- remember when his foster dad pretended to have a heart attack to get Horace Pinker out of his body because he didn't want him there, but he wasn't strong enough to like will him out? He- and then Horace Pinker was like, I'm gonna go into satellite dish because this heart's no good. Is that what it was? I thought- Yeah, because he's like because Jonathan oh, was like, I yeah. didn't know you had a bad heart. <laughs> yeah, and he was like, like I, I don't. don't. But Horace didn't know that. <laughs> Oh, Wes. Man, don't you love it when when uh, when artists are given creative control? It's just... <laughs> this is the kind of shit they come up with. See, and that's what I was saying at the beginning, is there was just too much creative so control. So let me, let me ask you a real quick question, then. Could AI write this movie? Yes. No. It makes no sense. <laughs> AI would AI would make something that makes sense. AI. No, it wouldn't. Not no, yet. Nah. It would just be like scene, 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 kind of like this movie. AI would know the structure of a movie. And the necklace is the power of love. Continue. <laughs> okay, well then, you know what? I take it all back. Replace the screenwriters with robots, guys. <laughs> I, <laughs> you shut your mouth. <laughs> I want more movies like Shocker. Like, this movie takes risks. It takes challenges. It's not perfect. I really do think it could have been a lot better. I'm sure even Wes was just like, fuck, we've kind of fucked this a little bit. I think he knew the risks involved in, like, it becoming a franchise, and he had so much he wanted to do with this character. Mm. I think he did it all in this film. You think he tried too hard with the first movie? Yeah, I think there's just way too much. Like, yeah. the entire second half of the film where they're going through the TV and they're fighting through the TV stuff, like, that's second season shit. Mm. We should have just kind of done the origin story. We should have gone, like, it maybe should have been a slower burn where we see him evil as a serial killer first, or we could do that as a prequel later. I would probably just get rid of the girlfriend stuff, like the necklace and the ghost girlfriend. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that without question, that's gotta go. No, like, them jumping into television and, like, fighting through the television is great, and, like, surely there's some sort of but, comment like, the that Jason, about that. But, like, the Jason goes to hell body swapping, yeah. like, that's... <laughs> <laughs> That's enough in and of itself. But then we're also doing like TV weird ethereal plane stuff. Like there's so many planes in this movie. <laughs> You're not wrong because like the him possessing a chair and the chair having eyeballs and stuff. That's a part four move. Like that's when we start getting real crazy. <sighs> but you know, you can't tell me that the best Friday the 13th is the first Friday the 13th. And the- Have you seen my ranking? Yeah, Jason X is number one. Okay, but that's... Uh, oh, oh, okay, but that... But that's that's for controversy. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Freddy vs. Jason is number two. That's also for controversy. None of these <laughs> movies are the first thing. And I was you know ranking them by funnest. If I was ranking by best, Friday 13th Part 1 would be there. If you ask real Halloween fans, there's a pretty good chance that, num- that Halloween 1 might not be their favorite. Same goes for Nightmare on Elm Street or the Purge movies. Like, I think as far as franchises go, it's not uncommon for the first movie to not necessarily be the best one. Yeah, but I don't think that statement is true for this podcast. What's your favorite Purge? The second Purge. 
You're wrong. I think What's your favorite <laughs> Halloween movie? It's Halloween number one. But I'm, I'm not the guy to ask because my second favorite Halloween movie is Halloween Resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> my second favorite <laughs> Halloween movie is none of them. <laughs> But like I, I, man, I really do wish we had eight direct to video sequels of this movie. Now, like, sure, it would have been awesome for them to go to the theater, but like, direct to video in the '90s is exactly where this movie could have thrived. And like, you know, perhaps some of like, my oh, this appreci- is a made-for-TV movie. Blow my mind. Yo, this should have been a made-for-TV movie just based on the content alone. <laughs> but yeah, like, it would have taken up a whole day of prime time though, because it, it's a six-hour movie. Yes. As a 12-hour movie, too much for TV. (laughs) Okay, well, anyway. uh, As a 16-hour film. Maybe a box set. Part part of part of my appreciation for it is is probably the promise that it shows. Like when you, <laughs> like I'm looking at this, imagining what ten more movies could have been like, and like, I get it. It's not a perfect movie. I have a fucking blast when I'm watching it, and I am raising my eyebrows just as much as you are. You Ma- fell asleep a couple times. Shut in this. the fuck <laughs> up. I fell asleep. I, this proof positive. I fall asleep during movies I love. It's just how I'm made. I can't help it. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'm. I'm not narcoleptic. I'm just. Tired. It happened so much when we were younger that we had to send him to the doctor to make sure he was okay. <laughs> I was just working too hard and not getting enough sleep and partying too hard on the weekends. It's just who I am, okay? I, I just have a hard time staying awake. You know, it's sensory overload. That's what I'm leaning on. That's what I'm doing now. Yeah, I hear. I hear. It's oh, it not was uncommon. too much. It yeah. was too much fun for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, you know what? We need to have a little nap. Process what we <laughs> what we've taken in. We'll come back for part two later. For season two later. You know, I, I hear it's not uncommon for people to fall asleep at the opera because it's just too much. It's just too... <laughs> it's not that it's boring. <laughs> it's not that it's boring. And it's dark. And you're <laughs> in a comfy seat. It's just that it's a sensory overload. And it's really, really calm. And because you can understand the language. That's it. That's the <laughs> other thing. Yeah. 3.5 out of 4. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's that's exactly how I feel about Shocker. It's a blast. I'd watch it again right now. And I, I also will never have more answers. Truly, uh, I, the movie doesn't necessarily make sense, but I really, I have a great time watching it. I, you know, I'll, I'll say that Maximum Overdrive by Stephen King makes more sense than Shocker, but equally as fun. So some of this movie is insufferable. <laughs> I don't but... like the protagonist. I'm sorry. Oh, the protagonist. Sorry. Oof, that was, that was <laughs> tough for a His voice is just <laughs> grating to my soul. Yeah, he's a teenage boy. It's 18 hours long. But 17 and a half of them, great. The fucking massage chair sequence mm-hmm. and the ghost boat girlfriend are worth at least two stars on their own. So I'm going to give it a two out of four. Wow! <laughs> oh, that was promising there. I was like, wow, we might get to three stars on this. It was pretty good. I mean, it's got a two star bump. <laughs> Fuck. Two? Just two. Not even two and a half. No. Okay. They didn't even use fucking Alice Cooper's rendition of whatever song that was that they played. No, we got a kick-ass Megadeth version. Although we did run through an Alice Cooper concert at some point in the TV. Don't you love it? I don't understand. Because, <laughs> uh, I can tell you exactly why. Because the production company that made this movie, which uh, also made John Carpenter's They Live and Prince of Darkness, featuring Alice Cooper, uh, is was created by Alice Cooper's former manager. <laughs> like, he started a production company for movies. It makes sense why he did also, like, just movie theme songs as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And it's it's the the, the guy, I, you know, the guy that's, that spearheaded this production company, uh, his, his purpose, his goal was to give these directors creative of freedom. It's how we got weird movies like Prince of Darkness, They Live, and Shocker. And you know, Netflix was doing the exact same thing when they first started. A24 Creative as freedom. well. Creative freedom. It Both it's, a blessing and a curse. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's bursting with ideas. Some of them incredible. Some of them less incredible. <laughs> but oh, what a movie it made. If you think of, of like a... Um, creative genius like, like in this Craven. case a master of horror think of them like water uh-huh. they need a container they need a jar they need a bowl they need something to just keep them within the constraint the constraints of a two-hour movie <laughs> just so that they make sense they need they need limits they need edges 
Why aren't you laughing? It was a funny analogy, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, anyway, that's what we thought of Shocker. <laughs> um, one of us loved it. One of us really loved it. Let us know what you thought of Wes Craven's Shocker. Yeah, it takes a lot of choices. It gets really fucking weird. But, like, don't you wish more movies were, were 22 this hours long? <laughs> hey, I gotta tell you, just based on, like, everything Mike Flanagan's making, most movies are 24 hours long now. Uh, yeah. Uh, let us know what you thought of Shocker. Hit us up on social media or in the Nightmare on Film Street Discord at nofspodcast.com slash discord. If you want even more Nightmare on Film Street content, consider supporting us by going to Patreon at patreon.com slash Nightmare on Film Street. There are tons of bonus episodes and even seasons of episodes to get your fix. We're going to be back again next week talking about another high voltage horror from Wes Craven. From Watts Craven. From Watts Craven. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> uh, but until then, I'm John. I'm Kim. Stay, Stay creepy. creepy. It appears you made it out alive, but we'll get you next time. Help us to grow the horde. Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you subscribe. More terror can be found lurking on our website, nofspodcast.com. Until next time, stay creepy, fiends. 